Hey everybody, welcome to the event here. It's our third day of our smart contract uh, security and auditing series. And uh, if you look to the bottom of the screen, there's a little smiley face in the middle. And uh, right there it says reactions. Go ahead and send a little something so we know you're hearing us well. All right. And uh, one of our rules here for our presentation is show lots of love throughout the presentation so that our presenters know when they are saying something that's really good or great. And uh, everybody loves to know that they're loved or that they're funny. Um, you know, we all try to throw a few jokes in there to break up the monotony. Um, I I invited Rob because I had heard him speak a few years back and, you know, we connected over a few items. I think you were at, uh, with Solidified, right? At the time you were there? Yeah, I was representing Solidified at, at the time at the, uh, Chicago blockchain. Yeah, we did the Chicago yeah. blockchain Some, project thing yeah. and the Voice of Blockchain conference yeah. one. Yep. That's right, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I thought it was really interesting. You and I had had a discussion to the side of it about the inherent nature of uh, security being something that almost needs to be crowdsourced because there's always a single point of failure if there's only one person securing it and a lot of people don't think about the many different ways that something needs to be decentralized instead of you know just the simple ways so i, I had a great time talking to you there and thought our uh, crowd could uh, learn a lot from you so today we're going to go into um you know after samsung talked about the different patterns and actual code pieces that put these bad patterns in uh on tuesday then uh, Taylor was discussing the the problems it caused and uh, how the development side needs to think about building smart contracts securely. And today we're going to get a little more into, you know, what is what is it like being a security auditor, and what does that job entail, and you know how it's how it's been for you. And um, <clears throat> I, I'll go ahead and let you give everybody uh, the intro of your background and uh, how you got into the auditing and start up your presentation here. Sure. Okay, so do you guys see the title slide? Is everything working as it should? There we go. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay, great. Well, first of all, thanks very much for, for the invitation. It's, it's great to be working with you again, Joe. And uh, today I just wanted to uh, as you as you say, just talk about what it's like to work in this field and some of the uh, interesting challenges that an auditor uh, faces routinely that that don't come up in other places. So I'll just give a quick introduction to myself so you know who's presenting. Uh, every everyone in blockchain is pretty young. Uh, I first started playing with Bitcoin in 2012 and. My life story is it, I had an epiphany in 2015 and decided, holy mackerel, I, I need to learn all about blockchain. So I took a sabbatical in 2016 to learn all about it. And uh, some of some of you might know me from B9 Lab. I joined B9 Lab in 2017, and I I develop or I, I I mentor developers from the very beginning to learn all about writing smart contracts. And in the same year, I met Ed, who is the CEO at Solidified, and uh, he wanted to start a company uh, to do smart contract audits because he'd heard that maybe there was a business opportunity there, and, and we decided to go ahead and do that. So Solidified was formed in 2017. And uh, let's see here. There we go. Uh, we've since grown to a, a 15 member core team and we have an extended community of 250 members in the uh, uh, wider blockchain community. And um, I just thought maybe a bit of a retrospective on what was going on at the time. The, um, the DAO had happened. It was uh, a real shock to people and it showed the need for uh, quality control um, and um, th the real question that was on our mind was okay well how do we how do we deal with all of this so 
it was a real wake up call uh, for everyone in the industry. Everybody was talking about the Dow. It wasn't the only incident, but it was by far uh, the biggest incident. And uh, lo lots of things were learned from that experience. What you know, what not to do, what to do. Um, but one of the the some some standout lessons were that methodologies that people were used to using didn't really work very well uh, in this context of smart contracts. Um, I really like what uh, Sergey from uh, Chainlink described this this software as he calls it. Uh, infrastructure, and it is actually infrastructure like in in many ways. It 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 just has to work right. Uh, and the software is immutable, and that creates unique challenges of its own. You you may not be able to re repair anything, so you can have non-trivial problems. Uh, non-trivial consequences caused by tiny little errors and oversights in the code and you might not be able to do anything about it and one of the things that really stood out about the whole dow incident was everybody understood the mechanism of it fairly quickly but the funds continued to drain out of the uh, out of the system so that was kind of kind of scary because it, it really drove home the idea that uh, you you might not be able to fix a problem even if you understand it and at the time, auditing practices didn't really exist. So we had to, we, we had to kind of in, invent it and think about, okay, uh, how, is this, how is this process going to work as, a, as a, a business process? So we started thinking about it. And what we, what we figured out was that uh, contracts are especially attractive targets because you have, you have big payouts, immature technology, uh, you have bad actors acting with, uh, I'll call it pseudo anonymity, and the bad actors are less prone to legal consequences than they might be in other contexts. So this is this is great from a from a hacker's perspective, and contracts are uniquely vulnerable because first off, there's a there's a tension in the in the industry between. Um, and, and, and Taylor touched on this yesterday. Um, we have developers that maybe have incomplete knowledge of what's going on. It, it's an unfamiliar paradigm. It's an unfamiliar language. I, I know when, when, when I first got into it, I, I developed a lot of concern. Uh, I was concerned that, um, gee, this is all this is all very strange, uh, and version 1.0 of the software has to be perfect in every way. Um, and if if one is honest with oneself, uh, I think most of us will agree that that sets the bar pretty high because it, it seldom seldom occurs. And, and then the nature of the software is that uh, probably there's going to be non-trivial value. It could be money, it could be access rights. It depends, you know, exactly what's going on here relates to the purpose of the of the contract but it's probably important we, we could say that and uh, this is this is quite concerning and we we should be we should be concerned uh, the other thing is that it's not just code quality the 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 errors might not exist in in some area where you can look at a line of code and say this is wrong. They may be dealing with incentive-based systems, they may be dealing with uh, democracy, they may be dealing with uh, monetary theory, and sometimes it's good to take a step back and think about how much do I really understand about this this subject. So the, for example, the, the code can be okay, but what happens to the system if a supermajority forms and they can vote to take everyone else's money? Uh, so there's there's the whole mechanism design aspect of it, and and is it sound, and is it is it sound enough to endure uh, forever, given that maybe it can't be revised. Um, now, what we noticed was going on in the marketplace was uh, lots of people get very excited about 
like great ideas, right? I have to, I have this great idea. What's not to be excited about? Because blockchain is blockchain is great. We can we can program money. We can decentralize everything. We can build fantastic stuff. And and so innovators get super excited about their idea, and then this this dark cloud of oh yeah, it, we we need to do a uh, we need to do quality control. And so it becomes a a, a to do list, and. Uh, and and so of course they they say well oh okay great uh, before we launch we have to get a security audit and that might be the uh, you know that there it might be an oversimplification of what's of of what's going on and that as as an auditor you know part of the process through conversations is going to be to uh, dispel some of these uh, some of these misconceptions. Uh, Taylor, I, re I really enjoyed yesterday. Taylor was talking about uh, irresponsible behavior and and uh, cockiness, right? And this can be a, a this this sort of thing can be a a, a sign of it. Uh, I made this little caricature last night uh, because uh, you know there's this idea that okay we're going to code it, and then we're going to audit it, and then everything is perfect, and uh, Ocean's Eleven is about this. It's a Hollywood movie about these guys who go to rob a casino in Las Vegas, and this sort of proved the um, sort of demonstrates the point that nothing is absolutely secure. There's no such thing as absolute uh, security. It's about you know if you have uh, you can be secure against certain vectors. If you identify those vectors, then you can do something about it. Uh, but uh, something like the casino vault in the basement where all the money is. Um, it is about uh, if there's adequate determination, if there's adequate resources, if there's adequate time, if the team is committed, if they have sufficient skills, yada, yada, yada. Sooner or later, just about everything can be broken. And uh, it's it's similar with nuclear reactors, airplanes, yada yada yada. I like watching Mayday. Uh, not exactly a plug, but uh, you know it's a it's a show about passenger airlines that that don't make it to their destination, and it's always about multiple things going wrong. If 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 one single thing had gone wrong, everything would have been okay because defenses are layered. But it's always about a very unfortunate series of events where the errors. The issues, the dangers, the failures uh, start to compound, and it just shows that there's no such thing as a perfect uh, airplane. And what, uh, what 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 I find in 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 dealing with the the customers of the security audits, and it, and it depends. Some are some are very sophisticated, some are not so sophisticated. But at the not so sophisticated end, they just don't really understand what a security audit is. Uh, but they know that they need one uh, uh, for for various business reasons, and uh, it's really important to um, dispel uh, confusion about it uh, for your own protection as as an auditor and to have good relations uh, with your clients. And the it really falls on us because a, as auditors. We know more about it than the uh, than the client uh, tends to know about it, and we come down to okay, well, do we really? Everybody talks about security. My mom knows what security is. Everybody knows what security is, and the thing is, yeah, but are we actually on the same page? So, uh, do we actually agree on what security is? And similar for the word uh, audit, uh, there's a uh, there, there there's an axiom that that uh, says that the the more people understand about something, the less they agree on what it actually means. So a a, a layperson will will say, "Oh yes, I know what uh, I know what security is. I have financial security, personal security, um, I have password security." Uh, or my my sister works for an auditor, and I know what she does, so therefore I know what uh, an an audit is. If you dig into this kind of stuff, nine times out of ten, you're going to find there's a bit of a gap, and it's, it sort of falls on us to close the gap. So either we either we deliver something to the client that meets their 
expectations or we uh, manage the expectations so that it meets what we can actually uh, deliver. And it's important to do that because a happy client is when expectations meet up with, with reality. A disconnect between this expectations and reality is always uh, a, a tense situation. So uh, you might not agree with this, um, with this summary because we don't all actually agree on what security is when we get right down to it. Uh, but I like to think of it as availability, integrity, and confidentiality. And I know when I'm speaking to someone that they might perceive that it means any combination of those three things. So for example, in, the, uh, in certain fields, uh, like uh, for example, um, public securities, when when well actually there's a there's a homonym there because this security means something entirely different uh, but they're also familiar with the confidentiality aspect of it because they are accustomed to having announcements that must not be released before the market actually closes so no, no one must know about this announcement until a certain time we have a confidentiality concern uh, availability is um, you know, can I can I get it back? So if I buy house insurance, what I'm really buying is availability because if my house burns down, then I don't get to live in it anymore. And uh, it, there's maybe availability of my personal finances as well that have been destroyed by the house fire. So I buy insurance to protect my financial security uh, on that. Uh, integrity is when, uh, yes, we do have the information and we have kept it confidential, but something scribbled all over the information and we don't trust it anymore. And it's in to 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 close the communication gap, it's it's really important to kind of figure out where is somebody coming from and how can I kind of uh, adjust that conversation so that we are actually talking about the uh, the same thing. So in the context of smart contract security, um, simple idea, nobody likes surprises. And you know the whole idea of smart contracts is deterministic machines that produce predictable results. So anything that happens that poses a surprise to somebody is probably not a, a, a good thing. And arguably that that is a, a security problem. It could be a major, minor, critical, uh, but if it's a surprise, then it's probably a security concern. And an audit is a meticulous search at a, a pretty high level. Um, and th this kind of speaks to the idea of um, what it is not as well as what it is. So an, an audit is not formal verification. An audit is not a, a, a warranty or a guarantee that it does exactly everything that it's supposed to do in all cases, no exceptions, and always will, even if the uh, EVM protocol changes in some breaking way. Uh, it's none of those things. It's a, it's a meticulous search uh, of formal examination and this is where the formative part of the industry is that as, as, as an auditor, as you go out there, you're going to find that each organization has their own unique approach to this. And that, that will cover things like what is in scope, what is out of scope, what tools do we use, uh, how do we organize ourselves uh, in, internally. And um, a little bit of a, a, a personal opinion to me that I think the audit should always involve an element of reputational risk for the auditor themselves. Uh, and this is, um, I guess, anecdotal from, from personal experience. I, I would need both hands to count the number of times that naive clients have gone off and, and um, you know they 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 arrive and they have they have code that doesn't pass um, you know first glance it it doesn't look very good and they they say well we already got an audit from somebody that no one's ever heard of and now they're you know now that now they're in some kind of trouble and and it, it seems to me that the common element there is that 
the auditor had no reputation to lose. And so it was easy to produce a shoddy audit report and kind of check the to-do list to make the CEO happy so that they could make it, um, um, you know, so that they, they could feel safe to the law. So you have the, they created the illusion of due diligence, but nobody was really terribly serious about finding actual uh, problems. And uh, I, I believe it's a fair statement. Certainly when we, when, when, when we do it, uh, we l look at our reputational risk of every project that we accept because so far we have a good track record and our, our nightmare scenario is to pass a, a project, it goes into production and then turns out to be one of the incidents that we've all, all heard about. Um, and uh, again, this will be just a, a little bit opinionated and it's, a, uh, it, it's, it's certainly open for discussion. Uh, it's a human powered process. Um, any, there are, Tremendous tools out there, they're all good, but in the in the hierarchy of the way things work, uh, we think that a human being has to be present to decide, uh, you know, to make the, the executive judgment calls to determine what's a false positive and what's interesting and what needs to be dug into uh, further. Now, I mentioned that the auditor takes on some risk, and this is this is the right alignment of incentives because the auditor is saying, "Here I am, and I know, uh, you know, we we know what we're doing. We have a process. We have a methodology. That's what you're buying. You're buying the methodology. It's going to be this meticulous search. We're going to do a bunch of things. You should believe in the process. And when we uh, when we put a seal of approval if you like on the on the project we're we're putting reputation at stake so that's the solution it's it's, it's similar to the nothing at stake problem that we talk about all the time in in blockchain so it it makes sense for the auditor to say i know how to manage this risk and we've built a big process around that uh that makes it it's really the auditor saying i've built a process that makes our organization feel comfortable accepting the risk to put our reputation on the line for the client if that if that makes any sense I, it makes sense in my head i'm not sure i've really articulated it uh, super well um, now i've talked a lot about reducing the risk uh, and but we haven't talked about whose risk and there's an interesting aspect of the relationship between the auditor and the client. So normally the customer is always right. The, the you know, the, the customer hires you to do something, you do something for the customer, the customer is happy, you get paid. And it's a, it's a, a two party sort of association. Uh, here in this case is actually triangular because there are other parties involved and what the auditor has to uh, realize or, or will realize very quickly is that the client is paying for the audit. And by, by paying for the audit, the client is agreeing that the methodology should be applied to their project. But when the audit is complete, what's going to happen is the audit report is going to be uh, released publicly. It's going to appear on the client's website. Uh, it's going to be public facing for the whole world and other people are going to look at this audit. They're going to say, well, they're, they're going to be users trying to figure out if it works. Uh, they're going to be investors. They could be insurers. Uh, there could be other projects that want to glob onto it. And what one needs to think about is that the, the uh, users uh, you know, the audience is more than the client that's 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 paying you. And this is something to keep in mind because um, the client doesn't necessarily agree with everything in the audit report. and that's that's where the discussions get get interesting. so it's it's a good thing to think about uh, think about this stuff ahead of time. Remember the nature of the deal. Remember that you're agreeing to assume some risk and do it your way. 
And a, a good example of the this this is a pretty typical uh, pretty typical sort of conversation. The auditor produces a report. The 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 audit is critical of a design aspect of the system. The client doesn't agree because uh, they, they this is the way they designed it, and they don't and they don't want that criticism in the in the audit report. And now now you have to really stop and think a little bit about your 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 principles and the logic of the way that you designed the methodology right remember that nobody likes surprises they might be users they might be insurers uh where you know companies are experimenting with the idea of insuring losses from smart contracts okay so if they are relying on like, not everybody is technical not everybody has the ability to deep dive into the system they're relying on the auditors to actually do that and then produce a report so they're probably going to look at a human readable description of what the system does and a human readable assessment from the auditor and they're relying on this to surface any any uh, unknown uh, unknown uh, risk factors and I would probably advise not not legal advice but more just in, instinctive advice I would probably say that if you have compromised the warnings or soft pedaled the issues in the audit report that that could be construed as colluding with the client and then if people have been materially damaged because they relied on the audit report then maybe not the the maybe not super nice things happen and that gives some hints about how to design uh, an audit report um, i mentioned that it should explain exactly what it is and exactly what it isn't uh, so describe the methodology what was done what wasn't done what does it mean what does it not mean right and uh, at at solidified we uh, are are very uh, deliberate about making sure that we design the report with two audiences in mind. Um, we make sure that every issue is explained in a way that a reasonably intelligent non-expert person can understand exactly what the impact is, exactly what the risk is, exactly why it matters from a business perspective. So it, it might say something like uh, collusion between certain parties could result in a vote that uh, the minority lose all their money. Um, something of some, something understandable along along those lines. And then we follow up with a technical description so that a reasonably competent solidity person can immediately look at the lines of code involved, what's going on, and verify that the claim exists. And so what what happens there is whether it's the developer or the insurer or investor or or whomever, uh, they can, their their business people can understand the importance of it, and their own technical people that they trust can immediately verify that the issue is is real, right? And then uh, and th and then decide what to what to do about it. Now, how we find the issue, I think, and I, I think that, uh, that Sam did a great <laughs> a great job of explaining. Uh, how to dig through through code, and of course, there's the training program ahead. So there's, I'll, I'll, I just, I, I will just say that there's there's a lot of techniques and a lot of things that one can do uh, to get it uh, to get it done. Uh, but at a very high level, uh, one one thing that we do at Solidify is we insist on a code freeze. If it's a moving target, if they're still committing to the repo twice a day or twice a week, uh, it's not ready to audit it. We we a, a moving target just confuses everybody, and that doesn't lead to a uh, great result. So it, it has to be a code phrase. And then the way that we do it is, we we found that the the, the tooling and the methodologies, the uh, uh, the ways of approaching this are evolving all the time. New tools are coming on all the time, and if we if if, if we were too opinionated about what to do. It would always be changing. It would always be internal religious wars about what to use, and uh, wouldn't necessarily be be right in any case. And and so what we've decided to do is we we decide well we believe in layered security, right? Yeah, 
Okay, great. So what we're going to do is we're going to have, we, we, we believe in incentives, right? Yeah, okay, great. Uh, we believe in competition, right? Yeah, okay. What we decided to do was actually split it off into three separate audits. It's, it's usually three. And they work in a, a double blind scenario. So the auditors don't know who the other two are. And they each produce their own draft audit report using any tool that they that they like. We we select the team by areas of expertise, you know, who's who's best suited to the to the subject matter and the complexity and that that's a that's a whole other thing. But once once it once it starts, they work in isolation and they audit the whole thing. And this is a little different than a team working together or uh, dividing the code and trying to audit separate parts and things of that nature. And we think it works better because it, it avoids groupthink. Uh, the dominant personalities in the room don't overrule the, uh, uh, the quieter personalities. They, they each have to produce their own audit and present it to the group. And it creates healthy competition because they don't want to miss something that their that their peers missed. And then the layering means that hey, if something is like really subtle, really hard to find, there's three times as many opportunities to. It's three times more likely that one of them is going to find it, and then he will present it to the others. And then the when they unveil it simultaneously, it's kind of like locking the jury in a room. And we insist on 100% uh, consensus, 100% agreement. So any, you know, is it a bug? Is it a feature? Is it big? Is it small? All that kind of contention stuff, they have to work through it through a, a Darwinian battle of ideas, if you like. <laughs> and eventually, when everyone is on board and it's unanimous, then they present a finding back to the client, which is a, a, a preliminary report that only the client sees. And then the client responds to each concern. So the, the response can be um, human readable. Well, this is why we did it a certain way and this is what we're going to do. And you know th that's, that's gonna be handled by external governance or uh, um, you know it's by design. Uh, and that's okay and we'll, we'll mark it acknowledged, but we'll also put the the client's uh, the client's response goes in the audit report, and this is very clarifying for the users, other stakeholders in the system because they can see exactly what we think is a security concern, and exactly what the client thinks about it. Other times it's code, and uh, the remedial changes to the system get um, they get reviewed by the same team because, of course they have the familiarity with the system. They have to understand, they have to comment if the, yes, the issue is resolved. And importantly, no, uh, the resolution to the problem has not introduced any new problem. Um, so that's one way of doing it. That's, that's how, uh, in, at a very high level overview, that's, that's how Solidify does it. Uh, it is a little expensive, not going to lie, uh, but we're not necessarily going for the lowest cost way uh, to get this done. Um, it, there's a bit of a, um, always with security, security is, you know, if you locked your key in the car, then you know that security is always an inconvenience. Um, the, it, it's very typical in the beginning, you know, criteria changes over time in the, in the, uh, in the long sales cycle. Uh, so generally in the, in the pre-launch stage, top of mind is we have, we have deadlines, we have funding challenges, we need it yesterday, we really need this audit so, we, so that we can go. And they're mostly thinking about the opportunity, they're not thinking about uh, risk. Man, they know about risk, I made it like super tiny so you can barely even, even, even read it. Uh, and there are no black hats trying to hack the contract at this time because it's not even published. And uh, after after the launch, and this is what we try to explain to them, the the um, the the balance of incentives changes. Now there's significant funds in the system. It's probably open source code, and the hackers have all the time in the world. And the more funds pile up in the contract the more incentive there is to uh, to try to find 
uh, a defect with it. And so what happens is the owner of the contract uh, starts to have a psychological state that looks something like that. And, and th this is pretty common. Um, I, I can think of several incidents of people who, uh, who have a, a, approached us and you know the system is already live, and there's there's money pouring into it, and now it's their it's their conscience talking, and they're realizing that they're at they're at significant risk, and so part of the uh, part of the process here, I think, is to somehow help the client anticipate that this is the frame of mind you're going to be in in a post-launch state. So why don't we pull some of that uh, some of that commitment forward now and do do security right. Uh, at, at this time. So uh, as, as an auditor, um, the, the career path, uh, I mentioned that reputation has a lot to do with it. And that's, that's a bit of a chicken and an egg problem. You know, how do I get reputation when I haven't done it? When I want to do it, I, I need a reputation. Uh, there are some things that you can do. Um, you can build reputation by working on uh, bug bounties. I think Gitcoin is a place to do it. Um, lots of people have built reputations on platforms like like Stack Exchange, for example. As a um, as a as a, a a human being who cares about you, um, I would strongly recommend that you don't start out as an auditor as one person. It's much safer to join an organization where they have a methodology and they have really thought this stuff through. So they're thinking about the continuity of their own organization. And then you can learn from others. Uh, one such organization would be Solidified's Extended Network because we have a, we have a process for bringing in, uh, in, into, the, in, in into the system auditors that we haven't worked with before. And we kind of, you know, we have a, a, a process for how is that supposed to work? And uh, just a kind of a high level, uh, high level thought because this is this is going to happen. You know, the price is too high. The client says, "Well, you know, what can you do for a smaller budget? How how do we get the budget lower?" And uh, they will they will do things like say audit part of the contract or audit part of the system. And uh, in, in recently, uh, to give you an idea why, you know, again, every firm can have their own policy. Our, our Solidify's policy is pretty firm on this kind of stuff because we know that when you compromise the policy, you increase the risk uh, to your reputation. Uh, so, for example, one of the DeFi projects that you would have heard of uh, did approach us in a post launch stage and they basically wanted part of the system audited for for i guess we would call it uh, cheap uh, we, we said no and uh it wasn't that long after that you know it all blew up and you know so our in in internal message board sort of lights up because like whew, we we probably dodged a bullet there we we made the right uh decision and uh, so my, my strong advice would be to be very careful about what you call an audit, especially starting out. Another thing you can do uh, to sort of enter the field is if, if people ask you for an audit, they say, you know, hey, I, I know you, you're gonna be an auditor. Well, audit my thing for me. Uh, one thing you could do is say, well, I won't do a, an audit uh, but what I would do is I would do an informal code review and I would get it all polished and I would get it audit ready so that, you know, the auditors are not finding low hanging fruit. I'll, I'll take, I'll get it all nice and polished for you. And you can, you can do that to develop and practice your skills and also to establish relationships with some of the auditing companies, because then you can, you know, you, you can participate in this sort of thing and, and, See what's going on. So that's that's a uh, another an, another idea for how one might be able to get started. Um, and that's it. I I hope you enjoyed just a, a kind of a whirlwind stream of consciousness of uh, what it, what it's like to actually work in in, in the field. 
Yeah, that, that was really good. Uh, even better than I uh, remembered your presentation being. A uh, lot of love coming from the crowd here. And uh, we, we had one question fairly early on that I'll, I'll throw to you before I ask you a couple of my own here. Uh, and this one okay. was uh, one that Taylor touched on yesterday, but it was, what are your thoughts on Certix auditing of BZX? BZX got hacked multiple times, even with their audits. However, Certic doesn't seem to be hurt reputationally. Uh, they even went on and successfully ICO'd CTK after that. Gosh. Um, I, I guess the first thing I'd have to do is separate what I think from what the market thinks because what the what the market is doing wouldn't necessarily align with with what I think. I, I think the mere fact that you brought that up in this setting, uh, I, I would yeah. I would say, well, that's self that's a self confirming piece of evidence that there has been reputational damage. Uh, but it you know tech is known for triumphs of of marketing over technology. So I guess we just see. <laughs> That's an interesting one there. If anybody else has a uh, question, go ahead and on the right, there's a uh, questions uh, tab. Just find our session here with Rob and then uh, drop it in there. And other people can upvote it and downvote questions too if we get a lot of them coming in there. I see another one uh, came, came in there. But before we get to that, I just want to let everybody know that I put in the chat a couple of times, apply.kernel that community is where you can sign up for the kernel program. And it is a, a slightly competitive process. So far we have 157 applications for the security track. Uh, there's uh, three tracks going on at once. So basically the idea is we have 300 people learning side by side. In the first uh, block of kernel, we had uh, 300 people working side by side. They ended up coming up with 16 projects together that got funded. And they have over 50 million in funding already, like three, almost four months later. Um, <clears throat> so this one, since we're specifically have the goal on security as one track, the other tracks are, uh, one is for art and NFTs. Um, and then the other one is a female founders track. So we wanna, you know, kinda find a, find a lane that needs some support in the ecosystem and then support support it through the kernel program. And uh, it's not one of those things where we're like, oh, like sign up, it's gonna be $20,000. There is a small cost to it, but really it's about like staking a little something so you are putting something in as well. Uh, and that's actually through the smart contract, which you learn about right away at the beginning. <laughs> so right away you get into learning uh, how to interact with the smart contracts. So, uh, one of the, one of the things that uh, I I wanted to ask you was you know where do you find like business in general where does business come from do they come to you since there's a reputation and how often do you have to say no to people you mentioned saying no oh that's a good well um, fairly no is on a no is on a case by case basis but it it it, it usually involves some kind of um, the un uncomfortable compromise uh, to the to the process, you, you know, um, and and this, some compromises are good judgment. So, for example, if somebody needs an audit done on an ERC twenty token and it's all open Zeppelin and it and it looks pretty simple and we've seen it before, these are opportunities to bring new auditors into the into the program and pair them up with experienced auditors um, beca because of the degree of complexity involved. So this is this is a way, okay, we're gonna start you off on a beginner level project so you can get used to the process, the way the internal flow works and everything. And we can uh, pass on um, pass on uh, savings, lower, lower hourly rates for using interns or junior people, pass them on to the client. In in other cases, you know, it, it it looks well. It looks really complex, and it it's it's got um, it's got red flags in it. Um, things that you when you when you glance at it, you know that it's going to take a long time to really dig through it. 
um, could be uh, could be DeFi interactions. That's a big thing right now. Uh, it also could be the presence of assembler code. It could be the density of the logic. What's going on here? And you go, oh, I'm not quite sure what's going on here, but it's going to take me a you know it's going to take me a while to to dig into that. Uh, and then they say, well, we we don't really want the th we don't want three layers. We only want two. And we only want or we only want one. And we say, well, we we just can't do it. Um, in, in some cases, we've been known to look at something and say, well, you know, gee, maybe maybe we need more layers instead of uh, in, in, instead of three. Um, but it's it's usually about price and it's usually about cutting corners. Uh, and the answer is usually no. Just and it really is judgment call about uh, okay, how much how much risk are we taking on, and and how much does that compromise matters? Sure, sure. I got a another question here, and uh, his question was, why isn't Samsung up there on the audience? So I invited him up to <laughs> join us. <laughs> so we answered that question. Back. I'm gonna. <laughs> what do you uh, think uh, about the pr presentation? Anything you want to add on there, Sam? As uh, we involve you in these questions here. Hello, is this thing on? Yep. Yep. Cool. Um, I had a meeting starting at 2.30, so I missed uh, the second half of this call, but... Um... Sure. Seems like that mic's a little in and out here. But oh. yeah, in, in, in short answer to your question, it, it is mostly uh, reputation based, um, a certain amount of public outreach, like participating in things like this so that people know about us. And uh, there really is it the uh, the ups and downs of crypto. Uh, you know, the waiting list was was pretty long during 2017 when everything went nuts. And then it went kind of quiet over uh, crypto winter. Right, and one of the things that we've been able to do through our our business model is we've been able to to survive it and and stay with it because we have a fairly elastic supply of of of, of people. So the the idea of the extended network is to have a scalable supply. Here's here's a good one. Uh, Ethan asks, uh, how should an auditor handle being pressured by clients to frame their findings in a certain way? Uh, specifically, he said he read a postmortem of a compounder finance and the transcripts revealed they put a lot of pressure on the auditor to make the risk seem lower. Well, that that's kind of what I was alluding to, that um, I would actually plan for the pressure to be the rule rather than the exception because who doesn't want to send their code in for an audit report and get a gold star <laughs> right that's always going to be a part of it uh and for those of you asking uh, another question on the uh where the recording is going to be uh in the chat you can find the youtube uh gitcoin you can also just go to youtube and type in gitcoin find our channel it'll be posted in the next couple days um so uh, Zerdat said, uh, great presentation, and I had asked that question. Um, here, here's one from uh, Frederico. Uh, he said, I was wondering about uh, time as a measure, because as you said, black hats have all the time in the world. Is there something like a continuous audit, or do you see the same problem I see on auditors participating in bug bounties they audited? That's a really good question. It's actually several questions rolled up into one. So, um, firstly, um, I would say that we we do believe in multi-layered uh, security, and so the audit's not the end of the story. We we urge everyone to move forward, do bug bounties, uh, do do honey pots, uh, set up channels for responsible reporting. And and, uh, and 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 just generally um, carry on with a security-oriented mindset. Uh, the 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 question of the the unscrupulous, unethical auditor is is really yeah that's a, that's a concern and you know it it's a matter of reputation. Uh, so I guess the the 
you know, the attack vector would be that the auditor spots something really, really subtle, decides that he doesn't want to report it because he's going to wait until there's a ton of money in the contract and then act on, on that knowledge. Um, mm. that, could, that, that could happen. And so, uh, again, it's a, it's a bit of a plug for repu- uh, firms with good reputation because um, you probably don't get to do that too many times. Sure. That makes a lot of sense. Uh, let's see if Sam uh, was able to get back in or sometimes it's yep. his internet. Oh, there you go. Do you have any thoughts on that question? Um, did you catch that question there? Um, was that the one about auditors doing uh, bug bounties and stuff? They- yeah, like is he he seemed to look at it as it's an obvious kind of question to him, and it it, it kind of is an obvious problem of incentives. Um, I think Rob's explanation was good, but if you had any thoughts to elaborate on that, yeah, I mean, I can only really offer my own uh, personal opinion on this, which is basically, you know, I I think when I, well, when when I did audits, you know, I tried the best I can. And in the time frame that I had, you know, I, I reported all the bugs I can. Um, personally, you know, I I would feel kind of bad if I then turned around and said, you know, oh, actually, here's another bug. Now give me more money. But I could hope if someone else did that, you know, I wouldn't. And I, I and I knew they tried their best during the audit, like they weren't intentionally slacking off. I wouldn't fault them for, you know, coming back a month later with a new bug and being like, well, look, you know, I. It, this is just how things worked out, right? Like, if the auditor wasn't there, uh, someone else would have found that bug. Someone would have claimed that money. You know, the the purpose of the bug bounty is to incentivize people to report bugs to you, and it worked. So, yeah, it's definitely better than getting caught <laughs> the other way. In a way, a lot of times people kind of count chickens they don't have in a way in this kind of situation. Um, I think I kind of under um, misunderstood the question because I was thinking of something a little bit more sinister, where a, a disreputable or or just maybe no reputational auditor has taken some money to audit something and not reported all the all of the findings. You could then turn around and hack the contract later after it goes into production. I think he alluded to both of those situations in the question, but I think both of those are pretty good answers. Uh, I'm going to jump to this question here from uh, NANA, which could be any one of like 20 people in the chat. I love these security events because there's always so many anonymous and no picture people uh, compared to our normal events. Uh, So this one is, uh, uh, how do you uh, audit complex systems involving several chains? Uh, one example he's thinking of is Ren BTC involving Ethereum, uh, Bitcoin Chain, and uh, Ren VM. You want to take it first, Rob? I think the short answer on that would be a very somber introspective on whether we know enough about it to actually do it. So the first thing would be about putting together a team and seriously thinking about the composition of that team and the ability of that team, it's it's not something that we've pressed into in a big way so far. Is that kind of because you don't need to press into it because there's enough work out there? Uh, there's 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 plenty of work, and it's a um, we we have actually recently brought in. Uh, people with security backgrounds in other areas to to broaden the skill set, um, but just in in terms of the 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 way the parameters that were that were just described, my instinct would be that we would probably say we're not the company for that. Interesting. Before I move over to Sam to take the same question, um, what are some of those? Uh, other skill sets because we were targeting you know for people to come out and try this program we were targeting people with solidity knowledge but not a lot of security auditing experience um and then we were also targeting people who had uh data network security backgrounds in kind of web 2 but no real solidity knowledge uh, especially like distributed systems security in that and uh 
where, where have you found it to be fruitful to find people or where are people best equipped already to make the transition to become a security auditor? No, Rob? I hear you. <laughs> there's a lot of um, there's a lot of directions that you could go, right? So, for example, maybe as a uh, as as a company, one might decide, well, there's there's a lot of server based uh, trusted parties or something that are part of the overall system, and so we want to be able to audit those parts as well because there's this. Uh, there's this centralized entity that that needs security, so maybe we'll maybe we'll get into that. But it uh, the, the this the surface area of the scope increases very quickly, and and you know it's it's very important that you know one is only doing what one is very confident about being able to do. True. Sure. So let me uh, move to a next uh, question here with a couple of upvotes here. Um, how much time do you give a client to fix their issues? Um, yeah, again, that, that would probably be a, a, a company by company sort of policy, but we give them three weeks typically, and it's not a hard deadline. Sometimes there's good reasons, but uh, the main thing is that we don't want them to take too long. Our our audit report usually points out the um, the code and the concern exactly where the issue is, and it usually also proposes a fix. Uh, so, in, in, unless the the unless the fix is a is a real uh, brain twister, it's it's usually pretty obvious, and so we suggest, okay, this this is how you fix it. We don't want them to loiter for too long uh, because what we, we don't want the auditor's minds to their we don't want their uh, awareness of that they've gained through the first audit. We don't want that knowledge to fade out. We want them to um, we want them to be in a position to tie off the loose ends as it were and finish the report. So um, we put a time limit on it. Yeah. So here's an interesting one here. Uh, and maybe I'll start with you first uh, on this one, Samson. Uh, is, isn't there a general chicken and egg problem for new projects that they can't afford expensive audits when they start, so they postpone it to a later point in time and then just launch without an audit? Maybe how does that connect to this um, you know, test in production kind of mentality? <laughs> I mean, to answer the question directly, yes, I, th this yeah. is definitely a problem. And to be completely honest, I don't think I have a solution. Like, there, you know, auditors need to get paid, and sometimes projects don't have the funds. Um, I think what's usually worked so far is you just kind of hope that someone who has the skills and isn't, you know, necessarily driven by money is around and it finds a bug before the hackers do. Um, but that's obviously not sustainable, and I'm not really sure I have a sustainable solution. I don't know that there is a, um, a magic solution to that, but I think maybe through, uh, through dissemination of information, through events like this, more developers being aware that, uh, okay, there's a, different, there's a different methodology, and everybody knows that uh, after you have a candidate release ready, then the next step is to do audits and they take time and they, they take money. And when you're in the early stage of a business plan, everything is going to be fine if you budget for that on your schedule and, and, in, your, and in your finances. It, it only really becomes a problem when the CEO didn't see it coming. And you know, if he's coming from, say, a, an agile mindset, it's, I think it's pretty common. You know, oh, I've been building software for 20 years, so I know everything. Yeah, but it's 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 what you know that isn't true that gets you into trouble, right? And when your developers say it's good to go, and you think you're 
pushing into production the next day, okay, that's when you run into this big impasse and you know looking for money that maybe doesn't exist and time that isn't available because there's a you know there's a countdown clock on the website or whatever public facing commitments that they've made and now they have to walk it back and so so part of it is just uh, i think the more developers are aware that you know i i think the smart contracts are like hazardous materials this this isn't new stuff we've been we've been doing move fast and break things we've been we've been doing agile development we've been doing rapid iteration we've been doing continuous deployment for a long time and everybody knows how that works um but actually what we are trying to do is say well oh, hold on hazardous materials is not new you go into a safety oriented environment like it's a fireworks factory or an oil refinery or aerospace or a nuclear power plants that everybody likes to talk about you find out that well actually they have everything covered 18 ways from sunday and it's a uh, it, it's a it's a culture from 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 bow to stern so to speak and everybody understands that there's a really good reason because if somebody throws a cigarette in the wrong place in a fireworks factory, we could blow up the whole south side of the city. So, uh, you know, we, we have to do things differently and everybody understands that. And the more Ethereum developers understand that, then the more they will tell their project sponsors, the product owners uh, early, right? Because nobody likes surprises, right? Let right. them know early that yes, I can write that contract for you. It will take me about six weeks to write that contract for you. No problem. It's going to be really high quality. And after I write that contract for you, then it's going to go to audit. And audit's going to take anywhere from four to eight weeks. And there may be a waiting list to get in an audit. Um, in the middle of crypto winter, you could get an audit pretty fast. In the middle of uh, the craziness of 2017, it might have been a three month waiting list. Sure. So uh, from Dirk here, we have uh, in other fields, an audit is meant to certify you follow a certain standard. Uh, do you know of any efforts to build such a standard relating to blockchain security? Oh, yes, I know of many. I, I know of many efforts, but I don't know of any efforts that have really found uh, traction. I even know that uh, a certain financial regulator was going around kind of p calling all the companies and picking their brains to try to figure out, you know, what's what's going on. Um, there are different initiatives that I sort of participated in for a little while, and then the, the people driving the initiatives lost interest. So traction is, a, is, is another thing. Um, but, you know, part of my presentation was a little bit about um you know at a very high level you know these are the things that you, you know, that you think about when you're designing a methodology i think it's actually as you go to the different firms and talk to them you're really buying the process and you and the the client is making a judgment call about which process that they that that they want to purchase um um, all right, uh, we are at the hour mark, uh, just over it. So I think I'm gonna go ahead and break us down to uh, the tables with one final question, which is a short one. Is there any audit conducted for WBTC? Do we know? We can always look that up, but figure out if you either you knew. <laughs> we can answer that one and say we complete them all. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and end the presentation part here and feel free to grab a table. Uh, anybody out there, use the smart networking feature and uh, we'll see you soon. Go ahead, uh, gitcoin.co slash uh, live stream to get our community event calendar. Uh, the security session is over now. Uh, however, we do have a community calendar of all kinds of events like we have like six hours of events tomorrow <laughs> with the the grants program we have 160,000 in prizes for the grants round eight hackathon um so 20 some sponsors and then hopefully we'll have a million dollars going out in funding we have a uh, half a million in uh matching uh some of you guys might have seen the, the good uh coin desk and 
Coin Telegraph articles about Kraken donating 150,000 and Binance came in to support. So it was really interesting to see this round uh, groups out of consensus and Ethereum Foundation and you know, and last round even uh, groups like Iron Finance and uh, Synthetics actually making proposals to the protocol to put a certain amount towards Gitcoin grants to continue supporting developers. So the mission is to work for the open internet and uh, I'm putting the calendar in the chat and end in this session, grab a table, do some networking. Thank you all for coming. All right. Thank you, Joe.